Welcome to the University of Bristol's short course on epigenetic epidemiology. We want everyone to get the most they possibly can out of this course, so we've developed two online lectures to introduce some basic concepts. When you come to Bristol in a few weeks, we'll build on this basic knowledge to learn how epigenetic data can be used in epidemiological studies. In this second lecture, we discuss how epidemiological approaches can help us to understand the role of epigenetics in health and disease. Epidemiological approaches are increasingly being used to help us understand the role of epigenetics in health and disease. There is huge research potential here because there are many possible roles for epigenetic mechanisms. Firstly, they might play a causal mechanistic role in mediating the effect of environmental exposures on disease. For example, there's some evidence that DNA methylation mediates the effect of maternal smoking on low birth weight. Epigenetics might also be a useful indicator of historical environmental exposure in studies. For example, maternal smoking is often underreported, but offspring DNA methylation correlates highly with prenatal tobacco exposure and could provide an accurate measure for maternal smoking in studies where data is missing or of poor quality. Similarly, epigenetics could be a useful predictor of health and disease outcomes. For example, blood DNA methylation at certain regions has been shown to be a better predictor of lung cancer development than self-reported smoking. Therefore, DNA methylation could be a useful biomarker of disease, regardless of whether or not it is me mechanistically involved in causing that disease. And finally, epigenetic mechanisms might even provide a potential drug target to prevent or treat disease. For example, inhibitors of the enzymes that add methyl groups to DNA, called DNM DNMTs, have been approved by the FDA to treat various forms of cancer. Many common study designs used in epidemiology have been used to study epigenetic data. As with all epidemiological studies, it's very important to, divide a, to design a study that is appropriate to address the specific research question. If your hypothesis is that an exposure is having a causal effect on epigenetics and or epigenet epigenetics is having a causal effect on a health outcome, then the study should be well designed to infer causality. For example, using longitudinal data collected at multiple time points to establish the temporal sequence of events. However, if you're interested in whether, whether an exposure or outcome is associated with an epigenetic mechanism, regardless of causality, cross-sectional data may be sufficient. As we learned in Lecture 1, epigenetic mechanisms can be influenced by genetics, environmental exposures and random changes over time. This means that observational studies of epigenetic mechanisms are subject to all the same issues that face observational studies of other phenotypes such as cholesterol or BMI. These common issues include confounding, reverse causation, bias, measurement error and chance. And there are also some issues that are more specific to epidemiological studies of epigenetics. And these include tissue specificity, cellular heterogeneity, batch effects, and confounding by genetics. Over the next few slides, we'll discuss each of these issues and approaches to mitigate their impact on the interpretability of results of epigenetic epidemiological studies. So firstly, confounding. In this example, we're interested in whether obesity, the exposure, causes variation in DNA methylation, the outcome. Confounders are factors that are associated with both the exposure and the outcome, but not on the causal pathway between the two. In our example, the confounders are smoking, age, sex and socioeconomic status. If we look at the association between obesity and DNA methylation without taking these confounders into account, we risk over or underestimating the effect. For example, we know that smoking causes changes to DNA methylation, and we know that smokers are less likely to be obese. So if we see an association between obesity and DNA methylation, it could be explained, at least, at least partly, by smoking. 
As with all observational studies, it's important to measure dates to measure data on potential confounders in epigenetic studies and control for them, either by adjusting for them in statistical models, stratifying analyses by confounder categories, or matching participants in different groups on key confounders. Most commonly, we adjust for confounders by including them in statistical models. Reverse causation is an issue in observational studies where the assumed direction of effect from exposure to outcome is actually reversed. In our example, this would mean that rather than obesity influencing DNA methylation, the direction of effect is actually DNA methylation to obesity. Both directions of effect are possible in epigenetic epidemiology because exposures such as overnutrition can influence the epigenome and through changes to gene expression, the epigenome can influence phenotypes such as metabolism and adiposity. The direction of causation can be more accurately inferred by measuring the exposure long before the outcome. For example, measuring obesity in childhood and methylation in adulthood. However, such approaches are not completely immune to the possibility of reverse causation. For example, methylation in adulthood is likely to be highly correlated with methylation in childhood, which could have had a causal effect on childhood obesity. A better design would be to use longitudinal data and study the relationship between the change in BMI and the change in methylation over a reasonable follow-up period. If genetic data are available, another approach would be to carry out a bidirectional Mendelian randomization analysis to compare the relative strengths of the associations between genetic proxies for obesity and DNA methylation and genetic proxies for DNA methylation and obesity. The rationale here is that whereas DNA methylation and obesity can be influenced by many factors, including each other, Genetic variation is not related to the same factors and does not change over the life course. We will discuss causal inference techniques such as this in more detail on the main course. The many types of bias that can affect epidemiological studies can be broadly grouped into information bias and selection bias. Both affect epigenetic epidemiology. In our example, Participants who are obese might be more likely to underreport their BMI than, partic than participants who are normal weight, or participants who are normal weight may not be as aware of their weight as obese participants, so they might not recall their BMI correctly. An example of loss to follow up bias would be if obese participants, perhaps due to obesity related ill health, were more likely to drop out of the study before DNA methylation was measured at follow-up compared to normal weight participants. There is limited scope to adjust for bias in the analysis stage. Instead, care must be taken in the design stage to avoid introducing bias. Recall bias can be reduced by collecting data prospectively. Measurement error is a major source of information bias and occurs when there's error in the quality of measurements of the exposure, confounders or outcome variables. It's important to assess measurement error and minimise it where possible by considering the validity and reliability of the measure. For example, self-reported obesity may be prone to measurement error if participants misreport their current height and weight. One way to improve the validity of a measure of obesity would be for an observer to measure height and weight directly rather than to rely on self-reported data. The reliability of the observer's measurements could be assessed by comparing to the same measurements made by a different observer or by the same observer but on a different day. When measuring the outcome, DNA methylation, Measurement error might arise from the use of poor quality DNA samples, errors in the lab or poor quality assays. Validity can be checked by comparing DNA methylations in the same samples using two different methods, for example, pyrosequencing and an array. Reliability can be assessed by comparing DNA methylation levels obtained from te technical replicates of the same samples.
False positives are associations that appear to have reasonable statistical evidence attached to them, but actually occur by chance. Many studies in epigenetic epidemiology measure epigenetic mechanisms at multiple sites in the genome, which increases the chance that some sites will be false positives. Publication bias means that statistically significant findings are more likely to be published, so so false positives can end up in the literature. The chance of reporting false positives can be reduced by studying large numbers of people, which would yield more reliable, replicable results. The greater statistical power afforded by larger sample size will also reduce the rate of false negative findings. Regardless of sample size, correcting p-values for multiple testing is essential to avoid reporting false positives. Finally, if positive results can be replicated in at least one independent cohort of similar individuals, this would provide further confidence in the findings. Next, we will discuss some issues that are more specific to epidemiological studies of molecular phenotypes, including the epigenome. The first is tissue specificity. Epigenetic mechanisms are often highly tissue specific, meaning that an association with an exposure or phenotype in one tissue might not exist in another. Epidemiological studies are often restricted to using biological samples that can be collected on a large scale, non-invasively, such as blood and saliva. This raises the question of whether these tissues are biologically relevant. Would we expect obesity to cause functionally relevant changes to DNA methylation in blood, for example, or would such an effect only be relevant if it were seen in a tissue such as adipose or liver? One solution is to conduct studies only in relevant tissues, but this can be tricky. Firstly, it can be difficult to define what the most relevant tissue is. For example, in the case of obesity, would it be adipose, liver, appetite control centres in the brain, etc. Secondly, it's often not feasible or impossible to carry out invasive tissue collection in large-scale and prospective studies. Another approach would be to carry out your main analysis using available samples and then select and then check how epigenetic mechanisms in your samples correlate with those in a smaller sample of relevant tissues, perhaps using publicly available data. Tissue specificity is an important consideration if you're interested in causal mechanisms. However, if you're less concerned with causality and are instead investigating epigenetic measurements as biomarkers of exposures or outcomes, then robust associations in more accessible tissues, such as blood, will be more useful. Epigenetic mechanisms are highly tissue-specific because they are highly cell-type specific. So this means that in samples such as blood, which are comprised of many different types of cells, the proportion of cell types can influence epigenetic measurements. So in our example, differences in DNA methylation between obese and non-obese individuals might be due to differences in the proportion of different cell types in each group, rather than any true difference in DNA methylation. Depending on the research question, cellular heterogeneity can either be a confounding factor, i.e. influencing obesity and DNA methylation, or on the causal pathway i.e. obesity influences cellular heterogeneity, which influences DNA methylation. Either way, cellular heterogeneity has such a strong effect on epigenetic measurements that it should be considered in all epigenetic epidemiological studies, especially when interested in causality. There are several methods that attempt to control for cellular heterogeneity. One approach is to measure epigenetic data in samples that have been purified to contain only one cell type, or to measure epigenetic data in heterogeneous samples, but measure the proportion of each subtype as well and then adjust for this in the analysis stage. However, both of these options are often impossible in epidemiological studies where the DNA might have already been extracted. Therefore, several approaches that attempt to control for cellular heterogeneity at the analysis stage have been developed.
and these will be discussed in more detail on the main course. Technical batch is another big source of variation in epigenetic data. This means any non-biological source of variation that might occur due to differences in the ways that samples were stored, processed or analysed in the lab. For example, in DNA methylation array experiments, there's usually a major difference in DNA methylation associated with plate ID. Other sources of batch effects include using different reagents, running samples on different days, and using different lab staff, etc. The effects of technical factors can be minimised by ensuring that samples are randomly allocated to different batches. So in our example, we would make sure that the samples from obese people were run alongside samples from non-obese, rather than being split into completely different batches. Normalising data, for example using control probes on an array, can help bring data from different batches into the same register. You'll learn how to do this on the main course. It's also important to record information about lab procedures that might introduce a batch effect and then observe whether these factors are correlated with your methylation data. Even if there is no clear association with your phenotype of interest, technical factors have such a large influence on epigenetic data that it's usually advisable to account for them in analyses. Adjusting for known technical factors in analyses is a common and useful strategy. Alternatively, principal components and similar methods can be used to adjust for multiple known and or unknown technical factors. In the context of epigenetic epidemiology, the underlying genetic architecture of the epigenome is a specific type of confounder that has the potential to drive associations with phenotypes. For example, adults who are homozygous for a particular allele of the FTO gene have, on average, a 1.6-fold greater rate of obesity than adults with no copies of the risk allele. If we also found that genetic variation at FTO was associated with DNA methylation at CPG sites near or far away from FTO, then any association between obesity and DNA methylation would be confounded by this genetic variation. If we were interested in DNA methylation as a biomarker to predict obesity or downstream health consequences of obesity, then the fact that DNA methylation is associated with both the environmental and the genetic risk would likely improve the predictive power of the biomarker. However, if we're interested only in the causal effect of obesity on DNA methylation, we should consider strategies to account for confounding by genetics. These strategies include studies of monozygotic twins discordant for the phenotype of interest, longitudinal studies of people before and after they develop the phenotype, genotyping the individuals in the study and then adjusting for or stratifying by genotype. And finally, if genotype data are not available for the study sample, a less reliable approach would be to identify whether there are any genetic variants reported in the literature to be strongly associated with your epigenetic sites of interest and then compare those genetic variants to those identified in a GWAS of your phenotype of interest. This wouldn't allow us to account for the genetic effect analytically, but it could provide some evidence of confounding by genetics. For example, if we found in the literature that one of our obesity-related CPGs was strongly associated with genetic variation at FTO, we would be more aware that the obesity methylation association was probably influenced by genetics. If studies are designed well and results are interpreted appropriately, epigenetic epidemiology has the potential to generate substantial new insights into disease mechanisms and valuable biomarkers. If you would like to read more about the specific methodological challenges in epigenetic epidemiological studies, then this article is a good place to start. Here's a short exercise to draw together the information from this lecture.
pause the video and read through this description of a made-up study looking at whether maternal smoking during pregnancy causes variation in offspring DNA methylation. Considering what you've learned about epigenetic epidemiology, how do you think this study could be improved? The study used a cross-sectional cohort design to assess whether maternal smoking in pregnancy causes variation in offspring DNA methylation. The researchers adjusted for, pot for potential confounders, maternal age and child sex. However, the study would have been improved by adjusting for other potential confounders such as maternal BMI, parity and maternal socioeconomic status. Reverse causation is unlikely to be a problem in this study because data were collected on smoking during pregnancy and methylation is measured at birth, so the temporal sequence of events is known and there will be no postnatal environmental effects. Smoking behaviours in pregnancy are often underreported and therefore prone to measurement error through self-reporting bias. But collecting these data prospectively during pregnancy lessened the chance of recall bias. The sample size of 1000 was reasonable for this type of study, but statistical power could have been improved through meta-analysis, which we will discuss on the main course. The research is adjusted for multiple testing, which reduces the chance of reporting false positives in well-designed studies. They also attempted to replicate their results, which is good, but the number of mother-child pairs in the replication cohort, 40, was probably too low to provide sufficient statistical power to detect any effect. The researchers are studying maternal smoking in relation to cord blood. We don't know if they're interested in the causal mechanistic effect, but if they were, then they might consider investigating associations in other tissues as well. In addition to adjustment for the potential confounders we've already mentioned, the researchers should have carried out further adjustment for cellular heterogeneity and for technical batch. A major flaw with this study is that the methylation data was measured on different days for, two, for the two comparison groups. This means that any difference in methylation between the groups could be due to technical batch effects rather than smoking i.e. the association is confounded by batch. The researchers could have avoided this by measuring methylation for all samples on one day or by randomly allocating samples to different days. The researchers didn't genotype the participants in their study, so they were unable to explore the role of shared mother-child genetic variation in confounding associations between maternal smoking and offspring methylation. Thank you for watching Precourse Lecture 2. We recommend re-watching any sections that you are unclear on. Remember, this is just an introduction and we will discuss epigenetic epidemiological study design in more detail on the main course. We look forward to welcoming you to the main course in Bristol soon.